Okay, excellent. And I will try to periodically check the chat uh, because I go into present mode. I'm looking at the screen that you all are seeing and not really seeing um, everyone's little thumbnails here. So uh, I will try to check in there as often as possible. Google keeps telling me that I'm presenting to everyone. I know. Thank you, Google. Thank you, Google. <laughs> okay. And it keeps blocking where I need to, the window that I need to get to to... Um, yeah okay all right so we're actually going to do uh introductions i'll explain to you guys a little bit more who i am but once we get into the actual nuts and bolts of today's presentation but for right now what i wanted to share with you all is today's presentation is called how pbl that's project-based learning and digital portfolios go hand in hand and when you access this presentation, there is a link there to connect with me on LinkedIn. I love making friends on LinkedIn. If you have an account there, feel free to shout me out. And uh, let's go ahead and get some thumbs up for everyone there. Before we get started, we're just encouraged to remind folks that in order to receive your credit for each session, you will need to download the Performance Matters app. It is available in both the App Store and the Google Play Store and you get a QR code at the end of each session to scan and check in to get your credit for attending that session. When you first open up the Performance Matters app, you will need the registration code, which is in the bottom right-hand corner, and then you will sign in with your NC Ed Cloud credentials. Most of you have probably already gotten a handle on this this morning. It's just a refresher. So for our presentation, our bit.ly link is there. I will go ahead and pop that into the chat. This will actually be the last slide that we will look at on this particular presentation at the moment. But for the learning objective for today, I want participants to be able to answer the question, how might the strategies and methodologies of PBL impact our effectiveness in assisting our students with building exemplary digital portfolios? And I know that's a mouthful, but we are definitely going to be able to effectively answer that question by the end of our presentation today. So right now, I'll go ahead and drop that bit.ly link into the chat. Might actually just be the whole thing. Google's not being kind to me when I need it to be. We're usually besties, y'all. All right. Is everyone able to open that presentation? It is a genially, may not be something that you're used to. It's not a Google slide. I'm gonna go ahead and copy the bit.ly link just in case that's helpful and drop that in as well. Great. Thank you, April. Thank you, Jennifer. There we go. We're going to go ahead and get started with that. I'm not sure why it won't let me do a separate window for my presentation, so we're going to do it this way. We might be a little bit restricted here. Yep. Thank you, Google. All right, can everyone see the How PBL and Digital Portfolios screen with the purple background? Can you see that? Oh, yeah, okay, great. All right, so. 
this presentation was created with Genially. If you're not familiar with it, it's just, uh, it's think of it as another slides deck or slides carnival, but it's not something that you would integrate into your Google Slides or into a PowerPoint. It's more interactive. Uh, their graphics are just super eye appealing. They go along with some really cool themes. If you've never checked out Genially, I recommend it. It's just a lot of fun. When I was thinking about what kind of presentation platform I wanted to use for a state level conference, I wanted to kind of think outside the the box just a bit here and genially caught my eye. So definitely check it out. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items to navigate this presentation you can hit the start button. Like I said, it's very interactive. On each slide, there will be a backwards and a forwards button. So if you were to bookmark this slideshow, if at any point you need to move ahead or you need to move back, they're both uh, at the top of each slide here, the forwards and backwards button. And you can also use the up and down arrows to the right. That's just a, uh, an, an automatic setting that Genially has for all of their presentations. So either or is fine. And then if at any point you need to go back to our table of contents slide, there is a stop icon here that brings you back to the very beginning. So you can uh, then quickly click on any one of these items in the table of contents to get directly to that slide you need. So um, yeah. And then so back on our back on our title slide, and we're going to get to the table of contents. So again, each one of these is interactive, and we're going to go through them together. So first things first, some handshakes here, greetings. My name is Casey Bergering. You may have seen my name listed as Kira. Um, I, Casey's just a nickname because um, a lot of people butcher the name Kira. I get Kiara, Kyra, Curie, Kiara. Uh, <laughs> so Casey's just a lot easier for people to, to remember. I have been in education, actually it's closer to 15 years now. And I, be, I began as an English teacher, as a high school English teacher. I am from New Orleans and I'm a Hurricane Katrina survivor. So my first year of teaching was actually uh, the, the spring after Hurricane Katrina. I had just finished student teaching and I went into the classroom. When I was in the classroom, I became really good friends with our school librarian or our media coordinator. And she recommended that I pursue uh, a career in school librarianship. And I did, I absolutely fell in love with it. So I did that for the next 10 or so years of my career. And then just this past year uh, with you know 2020 and COVID and everything, I took on a new role as an instructional tech facilitator at Southeast Raleigh Magnet High School. This is my second year there and I'm loving what I'm doing there. And we are fully embracing project-based learning and fully embracing uh, helping students build their digital portfolios, especially in the different academies that we offer at our school. So to kind of streamline all of that information coming at our teachers, I wanted to combine the two. And this is the result of that combination. So I hope you all enjoy it and get some usefulness out of this. Okay, so we're going to begin our presentation today with a driving question. If you are familiar with project-based learning, you know that every PBL project is launched with a driving question. This is often referred to as beginning with the end in mind. So if you have ever uh, studied the terminology from New Tech Network, they're kind of the gurus of project-based learning. They will refer to the driving question as beginning with the end in mind because the driving question really answers what you want your students to know and be able to do at the end of the project. So what I would like you all to know and be able to do at the end of today's presentation is to be able to answer the question of how might the strategies and methodologies of PBL impact our effectiveness in assisting our students with building exemplary digital portfolios. And this is the pinky promise slide. So if at any point you need to refer back to the driving question, hit the little stop and pinky promise is number two. If you click on that, it will take you right to it. Awesome. Okay, so a few notes on how PBL and digital portfolios correlate. So when I was doing some reading and some research, these are the things that I felt like they really, um, they interrelated so well and 
uh, after presenting some of this information to my teacher to my teachers and also um, trialing this with our students, uh, I found this to be very effective. My school way before my time that I was there was actually a new tech school. So we still have some staff members who went through the new tech program when it was there and they agreed these were definitely ways that we could double dunk, um, which just makes it easier for teachers. So they're not, you know, it, it's one less acronym that you have to think about or one less process you have to think about when we're trying to cover so many things with our students year to year. So how they correlate, the first one is with regard to purpose. So putting our students into a real world scenario where they have to solve a real world problem. And in this particular case, they are trying to make themselves marketable. They want to stand out when they apply to their college or university of choice, or if they're going directly into a trade uh, or a career post high school, how can they make themselves stand out amongst the thousands and thousands of pools of candidates that all of these companies and universities are receiving every year? And that really is a real world scenario, critical thinking, big problem to solve. So the best way we do that is to create a digital portfolio, which shows uh, it showcases our learning over high school, uh, the challenges we've overcome, the, the different um, solutions we've come across. It also shows off our accolades, what extracurriculars and clubs and sports and organizations did we help lead or participate in over the years? What community services have we done? What jobs have we held in addition to uh, going to high school and doing homework? Um, what makes us a unique bringer to the table, so to speak? So I'm just going to do a quick check here. Looks like everyone is going smoothly. OK, great. So in the second correlation, we have artifacts. So when you think about what students are putting on their digital portfolios, usually it's going to be things that showcase what they learned in your class. So if you uh, if you just finished reading Romeo and Juliet and they were to write a, a rewrite an act or rewrite a scene for it, they and their scene was exceptional or they acted it out or they wrote it in a group and they broke it down. You know, um, they have the capital INT for if it happens interior, like inside the Capulet home or EXT for if it happens outside, like the famous balcony scene. If they have some sort of learning activity that they want to showcase and they may refer to in a future interview, that product would become an artifact that they would put on their digital portfolio. And just to rewind a bit, a digital portfolio is a website. Students can usually choose what kind of website platform they want, whether it's Wix or Weebly. Uh, in Wake County, we strongly encourage our students to use Google Sites because it kind of just keeps everyone on the same page. It's very user friendly. It's drag and drop. And it's super easy to teach versus um, Wix and Weebly are awesome, but they just have a lot of different um, a lot of different formats. Also, we recommend Google Sites because we are a Google heavy school. And so it will play friendly with all the other Google products that we use with our students in that drag and drop, dragging right from their drive. Y'all get it. Uh, so each learning uh, artifact or the end product that a student would want to showcase on their digital portfolio, creating those would become a scaffolding activity in PBL terms. So every activity that the students do to get to the final result of a comprehensive digital portfolio would be considered a scaffolding activity. So that makes a digital portfolio as a project based learning project super, uh, super flexible when it comes to timelines. So this could be used as a semester long project in one particular course or you could stretch this out to be a PBL project cross curricular over a student's four years in high school. It really just depends on your creativity and what you want your students to get out of it. Uh, it could be broken down into many chunks by subject matter. You may, your school may decide that they want certain aspects of a student's digital portfolio completed by the end of each grade level. You guys will see some examples of that a little bit later, what that would look like in rubric stance. Uh, or you might, as a school, constantly be teaching 
uh, PBL and integrating digital portfolios at the end of units or at the end of each lesson or as a ticket out the door. Hey, you've got five minutes. I want you to write a quick reflection on what we discussed today as a class. Put it in your digital portfolio. And of course, the teacher would have the link to that. They could go to that and give some real time feedback to the students on that on that reflection. So those are just ideas that are popping into my head. Really, the options and opportunities for this are endless. So the third th uh, correlation that I found was the problem, the driving question. We already know what our driving question is for today's presentation, but how are students going to make their applications to their universities and their careers of choice post high school? How are they going to make them stand out in the thousands of candidates that we talked about, right? So uh, that would be the problem. Um, it also ties in with the real world scenario that we talked about in number one. The assessment piece huge. Oftentimes teachers love to use rubrics and checklists for assessing a student's digital portfolio. For example, is the student's name spelled correctly at the top of the home page? Do they have a brief biography introducing themselves? Is there a school appropriate photo of themselves that doesn't have uh, a uniform with their school logo in it? Or uh, if they don't use a photo because they choose not to, is there some other imagery that ties into what they're saying, what they're introducing on their homepage? Do they have tabs organized at the top of their website uh, or either organized by grade level or by subject matter so they can plug and play as they progress through the different maths or the different ELAs uh, throughout high school? actually throughout elementary and middle school too. This is not just high school. I just keep referring to high school because that's where I'm stationed right now. But the assessment formats, they're not really multiple choice, true and false, short answer, essay type questions. It's usually checklists and rubrics that we're using for both project-based learning and assessing students' digital portfolio work. Huge correlation there. Uh, students respond in my experience, students respond better to a rubric, especially if the teacher gives them the rubric or the checklist at the beginning of the project or the unit. That way, when they get to the end, there's no surprise as to why they got the grade that they did, because it's been communicated all throughout what the learning expectation is. Uh, then there's the evaluation piece with students providing feedback to each other. So you could do this in a variety of formats. You could use small groups or pair activities as a scaffolding activity all throughout the project. And then you could have a culminating student presentation day where students use the teacher creative rubrics to assess each other, give each other feedback, but also gather feedback from their peers on how they can improve their digital portfolios. So the evaluation piece is really critical when it comes to those four C's, right? Because you're doing a lot of collaborating and you're doing a lot of communicating there. We'll talk a little bit more about those four C's in just a bit. <laughs> Speaking of the, the four C's, so here they are. Yes, we are definitely employing the four C's in both project-based learning and digital portfolio creation. The critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and community uh, communication pieces are very prevalent in these. So what I have linked in, in number six here is the Wake County Public School System rubric for grades nine and 10 for digital portfolios and the rubric for grades 11 through 12. The rubrics are very similar to each other. So I took them and combined them for an activity that we'll do on a Padlet in just a bit that may prove useful, but you also have these individual rubrics linked here if you want to look at them. Basically, the 11 through 12 rubric has everything that not the nine through 10 does, but it has added some final touches uh, more on the, on the publication end, whereas the nine through 10 rubric is more on the uh, production and creation end, but they do flow very seamlessly from one to the other. There's also talk about a fifth C coming down the pipe. There's not a whole lot of research on the internet with regard to our fifth C of citizenship, but from the little bit that I've gathered, it's going to have to do with a student's ability to be a good global citizen. So how are they solving problems and how are they communicating what they bring to the table, what, you know, what 
uh, good citizen skills that they have to offer to the world uh, internationally. So especially with the past year that we've had, we have been very heavily thrust into the digital age, whether we wanted to or not. And our global collaboration has been critical uh, in our survival this past year. So I think we can see some citizenship, especially with regard to global citizenship, research coming down the line that may or may not be added to those four C's for a fifth C. Uh, right now, it really just depends on who you talk to. Some folks are like, yeah, I can see it happening. And some other folks are like, nah, that's probably not going to be a thing. We're probably going to have a whole new um, incentive piece that's going to replace the four C's entirely. But for the intents and purposes of today, uh, project-based learning is very heavy in the collaboration and in, in helping students prepare for the real world. And so these, these C's are what will make them an effective employee and inf an effective leader. They're what make them an effective student today and, and what will uh, determine their productivity and what they can give to the world tomorrow. Digital portfolios and project-based learning are very cross-curricular in nature. Uh, so a good project-based learning project will usually integrate one or two subject matter, um, I'm sorry, three or four, two to four subject matters at a time. Does it have to always? No, absolutely not to be a good PBL project. But a lot of times you will see that happening. And of course, with digital portfolios, with students showcasing what they've learned over the years, uh, ideally, even if they're, let's say, uh, applying to Juilliard, even if they have um, a ton of dance videos on there and they're super artistic, they're also going to have some learning that they did in the sciences and maths over the four years or um, K through 12 years, let's say, uh, as well on their digital portfolio. So it may focus on um, their dance elements and, and whatnot if they're applying to Juilliard, but they also have to show uh, showcase the whole student and not just the student as a dancer, right? So the digital portfolios, they are encouraged to be cross-curricular, but having a specialty area is definitely encouraged, especially if that student, um, you know, has a particular focus, dance, art, uh, engineering, so on. Um, so a good example of a PBL project that is cross-curricular actually attended a PBL training yesterday. I've been doing training and, and uh, training and presentations on PBL since 2006. So uh, yesterday it was a physical science project where students were trying to figure out new creations for renewable energy and discovering how energy can be reused in the most unlikely of ways. So they actually featured a pig farm in North Carolina where they used the pig feces, they collect it under the ground, and then they, they use the methane gases to then turn around and create energy that sustains the farm. Um, so it's a, it's a really gross process, but it's a super cool video. And you talk about using a video to uh, hook students in and really engage them into a project. You can't get any better than pig poop. So um, we were definitely engaged as, as adults, um, admittedly so. So finding creative ways to renew our energy, right? So it's a physical science project and obviously with a real world problem to solve. But we also, well, the presenters also launched it with, uh, they broke down the Manifest um, Destiny painting into three parts and asked us to just analyze what we see with regard to energy production and usage over time over these three parts. So if you're familiar with the Manifest Destiny painting, you can look at it and you can see trains, you can see um, carts being pulled by oxes, you can see people running, you can see um, smoke coming out of chimneys, um, you can see uh, a bridge being built in the background. You get the idea. So several different examples over time because um, it's talking about the inevitability of industrialization and, sh you know, shifting everything to the West, right? Um, but we used that. So there's, there's your art piece where we're talking about what's happening in that, in that uh, painting, because there's so much going on in that painting. You're tying it back to the physical science piece, right? Because you're looking at the different 
um, sources of energy and uses of energy. And that's the focus of the project. And then you're also incorporating history lesson in there uh, because you've got so much visualization over what's happening in the Americas uh, as it was colonized. The painting kind of takes place all the way between the 1700s and the late 1800s. So you can really analyze that from a historical piece. So you've got your history, you've got your art all tied back into a physical science project, cross curricular to a T. It was a beautiful example. Uh, if you want more information on it, I'm happy to share. I'll uh, pop my email in at the end of the chat. And also you have that LinkedIn uh, connect with me button as well. All right, so uh, the next piece, number nine, publication. Digital portfolios, when a student is about to graduate from high school, they are going to want to hit that publish button on whatever website platform they're using, likely Google Sites. So that way when they go to their interviews and they are writing those essays, tell me more about you, tell me a time where you had to solve a problem and think critically or think on your feet or whatever, they can pop that link to their digital portfolio into those application fields or bring it along with them to their interviews to really showcase themselves and their unique values. Uh, and then of course, just like as teachers, we're constantly reflecting on our teaching and learning throughout our careers. The students are doing the exact same thing. They're being held accountable for reflecting on what they learned, uh, what they needed to know coming into a course or a project, what they, what they wanted to know, what they learned, and what they still need to know even after the course or project has been completed. So we're all familiar with those KWLs. We're doing those as teachers constantly, even if we're not thinking about it. I don't know about you guys, but I usually reflect on my day and what could I have done differently, um, probably right around the time I'm eating dinner or taking a shower for the night. Um, or uh, if you're like me, your brain starts going a million miles a minute when you're trying to go to bed. Um, so I'll do that. I'll replay scenarios and think about better ways that I can tackle certain things tomorrow and start going through tomorrow's to-do list in my head when I'm really trying to fall asleep. So if you're anything like me, you're doing that reflecting 24 seven, you probably don't even know it. All right, so. Uh, so we've talked about how they correlate um, in, in the big picture. So here are some terminology overlaps. We talk about those four C's, right? And they're listed here and they're identified by Wake County. It's not just Wake County public school system. It's, um, I mean, a, a across the globe, right? We have these four C's happening, collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, and communication. And then when you look at them from a new tech network perspective, remember I said new tech network, they're kind of the grandfathers of project-based learning here. So with regard to those four C's, what is their terminology? You'll see that some of them are quite the same. Collaboration is collaboration. Creativity is the knowledge and thinking process. So how are students creating solutions to problems, right? Uh, the critical thinking is the agency. So what are students doing? What information are they gathering to expand their own learning to get to that uh, problem solution? Uh, stage, right? And then communication by New Tech Network is just broken down in more specific, whether it's either oral or written communication. That's really the only differences between the four. So when you're looking at these two tools, which we're going to look at for our activity, you kind of know how they overlap here. So let's go ahead and get into our activity. I'm going to stop yapping at you guys for about five minutes and let you all think about this. Here's our first activity. It's going to be a Padlet. The link is there in the presentation, so if you have it opened up, what we're going to do, if you click on the New Tech Network logo here, it will take you to their infographic and their five uh, standards for, their five basic standards for a project-based learning project, right? So there's the agency piece, collaboration, the knowledge and thinking, the critical thinking, right? And then oral and written communication, that's just the same as communication. And if you click on the Wake County Public School System logo, there's that rubric, which you are welcome to save that I told you guys about, that um, this combines the 9, 10, 11, 12 uh, rubrics for digital portfolios. So it just brings them all together into one unit, one cl quick glance that's color coded uh, and very useful. Take this back to your schools with you. You're more than welcome to, to use this. And just for convenience sake down at the bottom, the 9, 10 and 11, 12 rubrics are linked there for you. So what we're going to do is look at the new tech network framework and look at the Wake County 4Cs framework. And 
in the Padlet discuss how, how they overlap. So you're looking at the explanations for each and discussing how they overlap. So if your last name begins with letters A through F, you're gonna focus on collaboration. If your last name begins with letters G through L, you'll focus on creativity. M through R will focus on critical thinking and S through Z will focus on communication. So that way we have a mix of feedback in that Padlet. So all you're doing, if you, if you are collaboration, you're looking at just the collaboration bit on the four C's rubric and just the um, collaboration bit on the new tech uh, network rubric here. If you are focusing on critical thinking and you need a reminder of what that is for new tech network, you can go to the back button. Critical thinking is agency. So when you're looking at the new tech rubric, infographic, you're going to focus on agency here and on uh, creativity here for the four C's rubric. Uh, and then here's the Padlet link. You can go ahead and click on that. I'm going to stop talking at you guys, give you guys a chance to read and provide your feedback on that Padlet. And I will provide some commentary on that in about five minutes. Uh, if you have any questions, confused about anything, please pop your questions in the chat or you can turn on your mic and yell at me. You're definitely not restricted to any one C. If you have another C that you're interested in providing feedback on in the Padlet, feel free to do so. You're not restricted to your assigned one. You can do multiples if you like.
I have a question. Where is it? I can ask the tablet so I can type. Uh... You need the link to the Padlet? Yes. Sure. Let me go ahead and, and pop it into the chat. Thank you. Sure. If anyone would like to take an extra minute to contribute to collaboration, that would be awesome. Great, so as we're thinking about how to contribute a little bit more here uh, with regard to agency, which is critical thinking. So that's when the students are taking ownership over their learning and they're, they're demonstrating that growth mindset, that willingness to, uh, to trial and error, to fall and get back up. Um, failure is, is okay, it's part of the learning process. Uh, we often refer to it as fail forward. Uh, it's a learning opportunity. So um, growing from what they learned and from the setbacks they face. Uh, so agency and, <clears throat> and critical thinking are definitely um, alive and well with regard to each other. And then when you are moving into the creativity piece, the knowledge and thinking, what are the thought processes um, behind how students are learning, uh, what arguments are they coming up with? How can they explain things in their own words? How are they coming up with solutions? How are they using what they learned in a different course or subject area to apply to this particular subject area so they can solve a problem or find a unique way to do something that may not have been thought of before? Creativity, right? So I'm taking a look at what you all have shared now and um, so i'm going to start at collaboration and showcasing other ideas and experiences on solving problems yes absolutely um you know your way may not always be the best way your peers might have a, a better segue into something um appropriate tools for communication and scaffolding activities i love that because oftentimes uh, people think that technology is the curriculum. <laughs> they Google everything and that's not necessarily the case. Um, we've learned the past year that yeah, technology is a, oh, it's an invaluable tool in education, obviously to, uh, to keep things rolling even when we can't all be together in one place, but it is not the be all end all. And, and we've learned that uh, one tool might be suitable for a particular activity, but it just doesn't work in the case of the other. So thank you for that contribution to collaboration there. Reviewing and sharing information with their teammates. Um, to support team goals and performance expectations, yes. And, and also uh, adjusting their tone, um, their tone of voice to make it appropriate for their audience or you know, their volume level. Um, are they working in small groups or are they addressing the whole class? Um, body language is also super important here. What are you conveying um, because you're, you are, your eyes are closed and you're lying on your desk or because you're holding your cell phone in your lap or you, and you're scrolling through social media? Are you truly engaged? Are you truly listening to your peers? 
body language and our actions um, definitely convey a lot about our communication with each other. So create uh, going on to creativity. Um, specific applications of four C's, yes. And we've talked a little bit about how those two uh, overlap with each other. So again, bringing up the the new tech network uh, terminology for, I'm sorry, I clicked on the wrong link. Let me go back to the infographic here. So for when you look at uh, knowledge and thinking on the create on the new tech uh, rubric here. So problem solving, arguing, explaining, uh, synthesizing, um, creating, those are uh, the, those top levels of the Bloom's taxonomy that we all had to study to get our teaching certificate, right? Um, so that's the, the, the creativity, the higher level thinking there. Um, that has been identified by new tech that, you know, we're all familiar with. There's a billion terms to describe them. They really ultimately all mean the same thing. Um, so it's, it's taking the students from being the gatherers of information and putting them into, you know, the driver's seat. They are the producers of information. That's what we want. We want them to get to those higher tiers of the Bloom's taxonomy. Not to say that learning and comprehension, the bottom tiers aren't important. They are it's a stepping stones. It's pyramid, right? It's not replace the bottom with the top. It doesn't work like that. You've got to work your way from the bottom up, right? So yes, um, definitely a correlation with the creativity there. Um, the critical thinking, uh, identifying the problem and collaborating with others in order to find a unique and, and creative solution. Absolutely. That's a huge piece in dynamic learning and uh, real world applicability there. So thank you for that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, the models are similar in that they they um, incorporate important components. Um, students' future success. I appreciate that. Uh, digital portfolios are um, going to be a huge piece of their unique person and what they can bring to their table will definitely uh, contribute to if they get into that program of their dreams. Yes. Um, all right, scaffolding activities are also super important to the create critical thinking process. Thank you for uh, revisiting scaffolds there. Yeah, so um, uh, we're gonna talk about how scaffolding activities relate to digital portfolios in just a bit. So thank you for thrusting me ahead there. And then communication, communicating clearly in a variety of ways, absolutely. Um, that's going to be huge. Students are going to have to be able to complete interviews in order to get their dream job or in order to get into the program that they want or get the the scholarship that they want to you know, pursue their dreams. So huge piece there. The more opportunities we give to our students to practice communication at our schools, the more um, effective communicators they will be in life, right? So thank you for bringing that up. Let's go ahead and get back to the presentation now. I'm gonna click just a couple buttons here to get us back in that mood. Thank you all for hanging with me. Excellent. So we're going to move on from the activity and go on to the next slide now. So we're talking about when you look at peace, you think of the peace sign, right? These are all hand symbols in case y'all haven't noticed the theme. Uh, so when we talk about the steps of a PBL digital portfolio project, uh, so looking at the big picture of what this will look like day to day, we begin with our driving question. There's an explanation there. We've talked a lot about uh, launching on day one with that driving question, that problem that students are going to have to be able, excuse me, to solve at the end of the project. So that is our driving focus. Uh, in a PBL classroom, I would have that driving question posted somewhere, either on the board or on my screen that is prominent when the kids walk in, they see it every day so they know what the goal is, what our focus is on until that project is done. The scaffolding creation piece is throughout the project. So once you launch it, you set the stage, you put them in the real world scenario, you give them the driving question, you begin with the end in mind, <laughs> several ways of basically saying the same thing. Then you start the scaffolding process. Uh, so in the beginning um, of a digital portfolio PBL project, it might look 
very teacher led in the beginning. Uh, the students might need some hands on help with creating a Google site, with adding text to it, with um, adding text boxes or changing text color fonts, um, changing the theme. They don't want it to be the generic blue theme that Google Sites starts with. They want it to be pink or they want it to have a special background, have a special header or an image or whatever. Just walking the steps through the basics of how to set up their digital portfolio, right? So like if students are coming into us um, fresh either from another county or another state where they're not familiar with digital portfolios or they just haven't done it a whole lot this past year because, you know, pandemic. Um, so walking them through step by step, really like like feel the room, right? So see what the students need to do. And then you might, uh, you might do a little bit of uh, flipping classrooms in this regard. Have the students go home and watch, you know, videos one and two on how to create a Google site. And then they come into the classroom the next day and start creating it with a lot of teacher hands-on guidance, right? So um, this process, there's no real one size fits all. Your scaffolding processes are planned and determined by the learning needs of your students. So uh, every time you do this project, it will never look identical year to year, or semester to semester. It's always going to be tweaked based on your student population. Um, but everything that we do from day one all the way to the completion of a beautiful digital portfolio that's ready to go um, post-graduation, those would all be considered scaffolding activities. So if you only focus on a certain section of a digital portfolio because you're only focusing on, you know, one subject matter, you just, you know, want your students to be able to put in a couple of artifacts for um, ELA 2 and what they learned and some things they wrote and some reflection pieces that they did. Uh, interactive projects they did, then that's great. Those would all count as uh, scaffolding activities in an overarching uh, goal for the digital portfolio, right? Um, or if you are, let's say, one of the leaders or the gurus in the school where you're working uh, students throughout their career from day one starting to finishing um, and you have a whole school goal and platform um, of what to expect for students as they progress to each grade level and what they need to accomplish. All of those can be scaffolding activities as well. So that's the beauty about um, making digital portfolios a project based learning project. Again, the options are endless. Uh, the assessment pieces. So we're taking out the paper and pencil tests here, right? And we're doing more and more things with checklists and rubrics. Uh, so we've talked a lot about about uh, a lot about how um, the assessment piece for a digital portfolio and a project based learning is all rubric based again. So there's no surprise as to why the student got the grade that they did because they knew from day one what the expectation would be on the last day. Right. So um, usually provided by the instructor in advance, they're also used assessment pieces are used frequently throughout scaffolding activities. If you have one day where you say, okay, you're working in groups to get feedback on a certain page of your digital portfolio and everyone has to look at each other's work, provide feedback, and then reflect on the feedback you got, make some changes that were recommended by your peers to make it better. What changes did you make? That would be a one or two day scaffolding activity right there um, for students to make those changes, gather that feedback, but also to record what they did, you know, reflect on that uh, so they can report in the progress that they've made. Right. So presentation day, um, this is oftentimes this is my favorite time of a PBL project when the students get to share what they learned and what they're able to do as a result of the project. So on presentation days, it's not just the student giving you a link and saying, here's my digital portfolio, enjoy. Uh, you might want the students to create some form of a aesthetically appealing presentation platform for sharing out their digital portfolio. So now you've got the piece of the digital portfolio done that needed to be done for this particular project. How are you going to share that out? So um, uh, for example, I am the, the website administrator for my school. And so I update all of the things that are going on with the school and the various pages. And we recently had uh, an open house where my station was to help parents understand where the information 
is organized on our school website. So I didn't just have a laptop open with here, explore our school website. I made them a little cheat sheet that shows each tab of our website and what each tab houses there. So if they need to know about transportation expectations, they know to go under the students tab. If they need to know about enrollment and registration, they go under the Our School tab. If they wanna join our PTSA, they go under the Parents tab, uh, so on and so forth. So uh, that was my presentation piece of my product. My product is my website, in this case, the student's digital portfolio, but the presentation piece, how they're gonna share it out, that oral and written communication we talked about, that's gonna be the aesthetically appealing nugget, the, the um, the visual that they're going to use as conversation cues. And then you can determine whether they're going to present it to the whole class or in small groups, depending upon, you know, your student population and what your preferences are as a teacher. As they're presenting, they're also evaluating each other. So the students get multiple copies of that rubric that you provided on day one, right? And they are checking the things off of the checklist or the rubric as their peers present their tools and providing each other some real feedback on, hey, this is really great. I love how this flows. I love the theme you chose. It goes along with your chosen subject area. Here are some things that you could do to improve. Your, refre your reflection is a, is a little short. I remember the day where we had a conflict between a couple of students and you chimed in and helped uh, make peace and, and you helped them um, compromise on a solution. You might wanna add a sentence or two about that in your reflection, whatever the case may be, but give the students time to evaluate each other. It kind of puts them in the teacher's seat, right? They enjoy that kind of stuff. And then after that evaluation piece, when the students have gathered all of their feedback from their peers and their teacher, they've gotten their final grade, everything is laid out there for them. Give them that opportunity for, you know, 20 or 30 minutes to reflect on what they learned, their learning processes, what problems they, they came across, how they solved them um, as a ticket out the door or as a homework at night. Um, uh, just something that they can record either in their digital portfolio or they may not want it to be published one day. You, you may have them uh, set up a Google Doc journal where all of their reflection pieces go in there. And then, you know, when they're mature seniors getting ready to move on, uh, they can choose which reflection pieces they would want to add to their digital portfolio or none at all. It's, it's, really, it's really up to you and it's really at the end of the day up to the students what they want on their, on their digital portfolio. But the beauty of synthesizing it with PBL is that the options are truly limitless. Okay, so here are just some additional resources. I wasn't making up all of this information for you guys today. Uh, some of the some of my favorite research that I came across when I was planning this presentation. So there's a curriculum frameworks overview. Uh, New Tech Network, their website is phenomenal. It's very user friendly and it's very organized. And a lot of the resources that they provide are free. Some of those free resources are linked here. There are, um, there's a project quality checklist. So when you're thinking about how to do a digital portfolio PBL project, uh, you could take a look at this checklist and see if you're meeting the rigor marks that have been identified by New Tech. There are some project planners that you can uh, download or save to your drive and then make a copy and edit yourselves. Um, there's also uh, rubric templates for pretty much every subject matter you can think of. So you can get the blank template, but it, it's already tied to your subject matter, and then you can tweak it as you see fit. Uh, just as a uh, quick reminder, the grades 9 through 10 and 11 through 12 uh, four C's rubrics are on there. In addition to um, the Wake Ed Partnership, um, article that came out uh, a couple of years back when my district was employing those four C's, why they chose that. And I just included the article because it had a lot of uh, terminology synthesis with new tech network terminology in there as well. So I thought it would be a useful quick glance. It's, it's a very brief uh, blog entry, I believe. So just some hands-on resources there. And we're going to close out today 
with our last activity. So remember we said at the beginning of our, of our presentation, we were going to revisit that driving question. So now we're going to use the Padlet link to answer that driving question to the best of our ability. So again, I'm gonna be quiet and let you guys think for about five minutes to answer the driving question in that Padlet, how might the strategies and methodologies of PBL impact our effectiveness in assisting our students with building exemplary digital portfolios. So that's a long winded way of saying, how do they correlate? So answer the question in your own words. There's really no right or wrong here. And I'm going to stop talking and present our Padlet. We're gonna take about five or six minutes to reflect and work on this. If you have any questions, pop them in the chat or yell at me through your mic. Can you give me the link again for the tablet? Can you post the link? Thank you. Dropped it in the chat for you. Appreciate it. And just in case it's needed, I'm also dropping the link to the presentation for today. Thank you. I'm seeing some terrific answers here. As you are thinking about your answers, also think about how scaffolding activities would really help us enable breaking down step by step how to create a digital portfolio so it's in little digestible chunks as opposed to create a website, right?
So thinking about scaffolding activities throughout the process, I did forget to mention that in the beginning, yes, it would be very teacher led. Most likely the students would need a lot of one to one on how to create a Google site and how to upload documents to it or presentations that they've made to it or how to add text and change fonts and themes and things. Uh, but also as students become more and more familiar with the website process, uh, they'll need less and less instruction on how to add artifacts to their website. So you can kind of not step back, but just more facilitate, guide and advise as needed, but not really showing them how to do it or doing it for them each step, but just, you know, observing and letting the kids uh, figure it out on their own and help each other out because giving them an opportunity to talk with each other would close that jargon that we tend to have from teacher to student. It puts it into their own words. Um, so the students become more independent and this process is probably going to be even shorter than we realize because students are so tech savvy. Uh, they pick up things fairly quickly. So they might know that they might not know that certain resources are available to them. But once you give them that resource, then they just kind of take off clicking buttons and figuring it out themselves. So that is a very broad overview of what the scaffolding process would look like from start to finish, very teacher led to very student led. I'll ever, uh, let everyone draft here for about another minute or two, and then I'll provide some comments on what you've written. There's some really good things, so check out each other's comments if you can. All right, I really love what you all have written here. Um, some key terms that point uh, that really stand out to me, uh, showcase. A portfolio is a showcase of the different stages of the PBL process and showcasing what the student learned and what they accomplished as a result of those years of putting it together. Yes, I love that term showcase. Um, that's great. You know, when they when they go to their perspective, whatever it is, check me out. Look at what I learned and I'm able to do because I went to school and I got a high school diploma. Fabulous. Thank you for thinking of that. Um, I also have some consideration about the fifth C in there. And I appreciate that because um, there's just so little research available out there on that global citizenship piece. But I feel like um, especially now um, that we have blended classrooms and we've got complete virtual academies, that piece is going to become prevalent. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if New Tech Network found a way to incorporate that over the next year uh, or so, because there are some serious gurus there. Um, I also love um, the using the scaffolding activities to build confidence that's necessary uh, to gain the ability to work that way up Bloom's taxonomy or work that way up those higher order thinking skills. Thank you for thinking of um, how scaffolding helps in that regard. Um, you know, uh, 
a digital portfolio, if you just present it to someone, is, is a daunting project if you've never created a website before. Um, but if you break it down into little bitty pieces, today we're just going to focus on how to do this skill, and tomorrow we're going to focus on how to make this artifact, and you just give it to them in small chunks, they're really going to take it and run with it over, over time. So those scaffolding activities would be real hands-on in the beginning, and then the students just take the wheel and drive from there. It's like one day the light bulb just clicks, and we all live for those light bulb moments as educators, right? So uh, the process might be gradual, or it might be um, help them today and they're off and running tomorrow. Just depends on your students, what theater schools they're coming from, what former technology experience they have, um, what tools they have available at home. So many things uh, go into play, but the beautiful thing about something like this is it's never going to be the same scenario twice. So like with project-based learning, um, personally as a teacher, I never got bored. Um, I was always surprised and I always had a story to tell at the end of the day. Um, virtual Academy, I, I love that um, this person uh, made the connections between this presentation and their virtual learning. Um, kudos to you for doing a complete virtual school setting this year. Uh, you probably are more comfortable with it than I would be at this point, but you're absolutely right. A lot of the resources that we could share in something like this would all be super appropriate for a virtual learning uh, environment. So I hope you can take some of these tools with you for that. Um, and thank you for, for contributing that piece and for your attendance today. Um, yeah, uh, some other key world, keywords, digital world. It's not going away. You're absolutely right. It is ever increasing. Um, diverse environments. Um, here's that essential to student success piece. Yes, absolutely. Getting them to employ those four C's. I don't care whether you're 18, 75, or three years old. Practicing those four C's is critical to um, just being a human, right? Um, we are collaborative species by nature. So being able to communicate what we need and how we can help each other, um, super duper important there. Um, yeah, and, and so, uh, you know, developing the areas um, outlined for learning outcomes, putting students in the driver's seat of their learning. If you tell them from day one, you are the owner of your learning, um, you know, I can, I can guide you, I can advise you, but it's like the horse to water analogy, right? You can bring them to the water, but you can't make them drink. It's the same kind of real talk with your students. I can give you advice. I can provide you suggestions on how to make your digital portfolio better or how to tackle this from a different perspective. But at the end of the day, I can't force you uh, to learn. You're going to have to do that bit yourself and, and help your peers do it and hold yourself accountable and hold them accountable, especially if they're working in groups. Nobody likes that kid that sits back and lets the rest of the group do the work, right? And they still get the A. Um, so making sure that that kid does not exist, um, that's, that's one of the biggest challenges in, in a PBL classroom for a teacher is making sure everyone is doing their fair share in group work. So oftentimes they assign roles. Uh, there could be a timekeeper, there could be a note taker, uh, there, there would be a presenter, there would be um, a mediator, uh, you know, whatever the case may be, and then you rotate those roles to keep it fresh. Um, all right, so this is some great feedback, you all. I have yapped at you plenty enough. I know some of you could probably use a quick break before going to your next session. So we are kind of closing out a bit early. I'm going to um, stop presenting this screen and go ahead and give you your, your QR code so you can get your attendance credit for this session. And I really appreciate you all attending and sticking through this with me to the end. I hope you got something out of this. I uh, hope you enjoy this topic as much as I do. This has really become my passion as an educator. Uh, I love the concept of digital portfolios and uh, combining, just combining and synthesizing any kind of way that we communicate with each other as educators, but also how we communicate to our students. It just goes along with um, what has become my life motto of work smarter, not harder. So I hope this helps you all work smarter, not harder. Uh, that doesn't seem to want to work. So I'm going to bring this up as a tab. Loading.
All right, there's your QR code to get your attendance credit today. And uh, in just a bit, I will also pop in the chat the um, feedback uh, form for this as well. Let me go ahead and get to that next slide real fast. I might interrupt you guys for just a bit. Sorry about that. There we go. Feedback form is in the chat. Um, I will hang out until 1220. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, thoughts, suggestions, I'm open to them. Uh, feel free to drop them in the chat or yell at me through your mic. If you are good to go, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day at NC Bold. Go learn some amazing things and bring them back to your schools. And it was a pleasure to work with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. If you're still here, I appreciate it. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording at this time.